Welcome everyone to Ecology Live, our series of online talks from the British Ecological Society during the coronavirus lockdown period. Um, I'm Professor Jane Hill of the University of York in the UK and I'm Chair of the Publications Committee for the British Ecological Society. If this is your first time joining us, you're very welcome and why not join us every Thursday to hear a 30 minute talk on the latest ecological research while so many of us are working from home. And welcome back to all Ecology Live regulars. We know how many of you are coming back again and again, uh, which is great. If you're enjoying these talks and want to find out more about the BES or submit a paper to one of our seven journals, please do take the time to visit our website Thanks as well to NHBS who are sponsoring today's lecture. They supply equipment and books for ecologists and conservation professionals, and they're offering free European shipping until the end of the month for Ecology Live viewers. And there'll be details at the end of the talk. I'll shortly hand over to our speaker, Juliet Vickery, who's giving today's seminar. But let me first quickly explain, there'll be a short question and answer session at the end of the 25 minute talk. And please do submit your questions during the talk using the Q&A box. Um, there's no need to wait until the end of the talk. They can be named or anonymous, you can select. We'll then pick a couple of questions to ask our speakers at the end of the session, and we'll see how many we can get through. We are recording the talk and we'll post the video to YouTube afterwards. So without waiting any longer, let me introduce today's speaker, Juliet Vickery who will be giving lots of examples of the RSPB's work to conserve species and sites around the world. Over to you, Juliet. Thanks very much, Jane. I'll just try and share my screen. Now, hopefully that's up and running. Um, so, Hello everyone, um, and thanks so much for joining me um, from wherever you are in uh, lockdown land. And thanks to, the, RS, to the, the BS for the chance to share with you today some of the work of the International Conservation Science Team at the RSPB. So a couple of things just to put the work into context first. Um, as many of you will know, the RSPB is one of the biggest environmental NGOs in Europe. And the bulk of its work and the bulk of its spend is focused in the UK. So what I'm talking about today is a subset of our work, um, but it is um, a very important subset and represents um, uh, the work of a very large number of people, uh, both present and past scientists, our policy colleagues, and many in-country partners around the world. So a big thanks to all of them up front and particularly uh, to my team. So one of the great things about RSPB is that it's conservation action is underpinned by science. Now that science is very diverse in its nature, but it falls into really four broad categories and I'm showing them on this slide here. We use science to really prioritize the most important problems for us to address. We use science to understand what's causing those problems and then to develop solutions to them. And we use science to really understand and to know if those solutions are working. So what I'm going to do in my talk today is to uh, really share with you four examples of work that fall into these four broad categories. I've chosen a diversity of examples, so something in here hopefully for everyone. Um, and then at the end, I'll say something rather briefly about one species that we've taken from the beginning to the end um, of this circle of action. So let's start with knowing the important problems. Um, so for international conservation science at the RSPB, uh, a lot of this is done simply by referring to international frameworks like the IUCN Red List or things like important bird areas and key biodiversity areas. That informs where we work and what we work on. But sometimes we're asked to, if you like, predict problems in the future. And a very good example of that is the overlap between seabird foraging and the development of things like offshore wind farms or marine fisheries. And to give you an international example um, is some work we've done recently with uh, the UK Overseas Territory of Tristan de Cunha. So here's an example where the government of Tristan de Cunha uh, wants to develop a marine management plan for its exclusive economic zone. 
Um, and in order to inform that, um, some people in my team drew together some extensive tracking data around seabirds and marine mammals. And, and here's the result of that work. So what this figure shows um, is the collation of tracking data from nine seabird species and one mammal species, the subantic fur seal. Um, you can see Tristan de Cuna, the islands, and the EEZ, the exclusive economic zone, uh, is that figure of eight. And the areas shaded from red to orange are the hotspots of marine activity represented by these species. And what you can see from this is that you have high concentrations of activity around the breeding islands, also around these submarine seamounts. And these occupy about 25% of the EEZ. And this information is now being used by the Tristan de Cunha government to inform their marine management plan in relation to future fisheries developments uh, around the islands. And there are many examples similar around the UK using again seabird foraging in relation often to offshore wind farm developments. So that's an example of, if you like, predicting future problems. But a very large part of our work is all about understanding uh, what's causing particularly the declines of species. And as an example of that, I'm going to use a species that we've been involved in for a very long time. And that's this one. It's the sociable lapwing, which breeds on the steppe grasslands of Kazakhstan. It's a migrant, so it winters further south in Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. Um, and it's been in long-term decline, decline since around the 1930s. And the sort of working hypothesis was that this was linked to changes in agriculture on the steppe grasslands, particularly a shift from grazing to arable crops. So the first phase of the, of the science really was to try and understand what are the habitat preferences of the species and is there any reason to think that that preferred habitat might have changed in recent times. And perhaps the nicest figure to come out of that work uh, is this one. So this shows the density of nests of sociable lapwing on the vertical axis in relation to the grazing intensity of cattle measured by GPS collars on those cattle. And you can see the higher the density of cattle, the higher the number of nests. This is a bird that likes short grass where it can maintain vigilance on the nest um, from predation. Now the problem that that sort of threw up, if you like, was that this short grass may well have been declining in Kazakhstan. The reason being there's been a loss of natural grazers um, through hunting, uh, but also a cessation in this practice of putting out big herds of cattle onto the grass plains. So now this short grassland is concentrated around villages. And what that might do is make these nests vulnerable to nest loss through both predation and trampling. So is the problem then a decline in productivity? And that was the next stage um, of this work. Um, and the scientists looked uh, in a great deal of detail at loss of nests using camera traps and survival of individuals using ringing and colouring. And I've summarised the findings of that huge amount of work on this slide. And what this is telling us is the problem is not in fact productivity, but it's survival of adults. So the first bullet, nest survival was in fact low and lots of nests were lost to trampling, but chick survival is very high. So the number of chicks fledged per pair is enough to keep that population stable. But adult survival was low, in fact, below what you needed to keep that population stable. And if you do this, at a, if you put these figures into a population model, you can see it's adult survival that has the biggest impact on population growth. And that while you have to double fecundity and first year survival, you only have to increase adult survival by 30% to get this stable population. So it's not productivity, it's about survival. And because they're migrants, of course, this means you've got to start looking further afield for the problem. And that led to the third and final stage of this diagnostic research, which was to satellite tag individual birds from their breeding grounds. And the results of this showed some fantastic insights uh, to these birds' migratory behavior. And they're summarized um, on this slide here. So this is the migration routes for sociable lapwing breeding in Kazakhstan in the autumn. Um, and you can see um, two uh, migratory pathways uh, and a number of different stopover locations. Lots of fantastic information, but for the purposes of this talk, the most important thing is uh, shown here. It is large numbers of birds staging in the Caucasus, Syria and Turkey. And the presence of large numbers of birds on staging grounds at predictable times in predictable numbers uh, led scientists to be concerned they were vulnerable to hunting. And in 2009, the first direct evidence of this became apparent 
when large numbers of sociable lapwing were seen being taken almost as bycatch on hunting trips for bigger prey. So that was the problem. Uh, it's to do with survival related to hunting. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about the solutions at this stage, but there is work under the African Eurasian Water Bird Agreement, but obviously an extremely difficult part of the world to be working in just now. So that's a little bit about the sort of diagnostic research that we do around a species. Let's move now to the sort of work we do around trying to develop solutions to problems. And for this, I'm not going to talk about a species, but about a site. And the site I'm going to talk about is this one. It's the Gola Rainforest in Sierra Leone on the border with Liberia. So this is one of the largest tracts of Upper Guinea Forest in West Africa. And it's somewhere that the RSPB has been working for about 30 years. And it's there because it supports not only fantastic globally threatened birds like this white-necked Picathartes, but also large numbers of threatened mammals, particularly uh, the lowland western chimpanzee. So uh, like tropical forest throughout the world, of course, Gola is severely threatened. Um, and this map shows the area of forest on the Sierra Leone-Liberia border, the border shown in that black line, and the three patches of forest that make up Gola Rainforest National Park are shown here. And you can see it's surrounded by really a sea of fragmented forest, largely slash and burn agriculture. And it's this slash and burn agriculture that is actually the main threat to Gola forest now. And so uh, recently our work has focused very much on working with the forest edge communities around Gola and to try and develop land use uh, approaches that provide them with increased livelihood, um, but also support large amount of biodiversity. And through things like household surveys and community questionnaires, uh, one thing has come up uh, very often, and that is a desire from these communities to increase the yield and therefore the income from the commodity crop cocoa. So the Gola Cocoa Programme ha has worked with these forest edge communities to rehabilitate abandoned cocoa and to improve management and therefore yield in existing smallholder cocoa farms. And since the work started in 2017, the production and export of cocoa from Gola has doubled. So we've seen a much bigger yield uh, for export um, from these cocoa growing forest edge communities. But we've also worked with the supply chain um, to improve uh, the guaranteed market and the price that these cocoa farmers receive. And we've done that by developing and bringing to market a single origin chocolate bar, which secures a premium price for the cocoa from these forest edge communities. So that's great for the, for the people around the forest, but what about for biodiversity? Uh, and so a postdoc in my team, Mark Hume, carried out months and months of point counts, uh, surveying birds in the forest and in the buffer zone, working with the research team in Gola. And to try and summarize an awful lot of work into one slide, um, I've shown it here. So this is an ordination plot. It allows you to see how similar bird community composition is in six different habitat types in and around Gola. So this is the bird community in the forest itself. And there are just two key take home messages uh, from this slide. So the first is if you compare active with abandoned cocoa, you can see the bird community is almost identical. And that's great because it means you can improve the yield in cocoa in these smallholder cocoa farms without impacting on the bird community. The second sort of take home message is that if you compare the bird community in the cocoa with the other main land use type in the buffer zone, which is farm bush, that's agriculture, what you can see is that the overlap between cocoa and the protected forest in terms of bird community is much higher. So in terms of a productive land use in the buffer zone, cocoa looks to be good both for people and also for wildlife. But of course, the real test about whether this is a good uh, uh, option altogether for the, for the forest is, is it also stopping uh, deforestation? So we can't answer that for cocoa per se, but we do know that the programme of work that we're implementing around Gola does seem to be uh, protecting the forest. And we know that in, in two ways. So, the very early work of the RSPB around Gola was all about uh, elevating it, uh, raising awareness of its value and securing protection. And in 2011, it became a protected area. 
a national park. Uh, and we know that protection affords benefits in terms of forest cover. And uh, to show you that really uh, very simply, this is work by Alison Beresford and Graham Buchanan in my team. And it looks at the annual survival of habitats from remote sense land cover data at protected and unprotected sites across Africa. And if you look at these two columns on the left hand side, you can see uh, that for forests, protection obviously does have a benefit in terms of retaining the habitat. If we hone in a little bit more on Gola itself, this is work by Tom Swinfield with colleagues from Wageningen, which looks at forest loss in Gola rainforest in black and in other protected sites in Sierra Leone uh, and Sierra Leone itself in grey. And hopefully you can see the difference in those lines. Um, but you can see forest loss in Gola much lower than elsewhere in Sierra Leone. So of course, uh, maintaining forests isn't just about extent, it's about quality, and there are much more analysis to do around these kind of data. But it looks like uh, it's hopeful that it's working. And that takes me on uh, quite nicely uh, to the kind of fourth area of work, which is all about whether knowing whether our actions really are working. And for us, what that often means is rolling out small scale solutions to a bigger scale and asking if we can see an impact at the population level for birds. So we often rely on long term data and the example I'm going to show you does just that. And it uses fantastic data across Europe derived from the pan-European common bird monitoring scheme. And this data has been used to ask uh, really rather simply, um, does legislation to protect nature in Europe actually work? Simple question, very difficult to answer. Why was it important? Well, it was important because in 2014, there was a move by the EU to open up the birds directive um, for a fitness check. And there was real concern that this opening up would lead to it being weakened. So we were asked by policy colleagues at the RSPB to try and uh, investigate whether there was evidence to show whether this legislation had been effective. And very brilliant analyst in my team, Fiona Sanderson, I used the Peckins data to ask exactly that question. And the answer is, yes, it has been effective in protecting bird species over time. And the results you can see in this graph. So what this figure shows is an index of bird population trends for uh, populations in countries that joined the EU before 2004 and after 2004. The blue bars represent species are protected under the EU legislation, Annex 1 species, and the grey are unprotected. And you can see, I think, uh, very quickly, that the population trends of protected species tend to be more positive than the population trends of those that are unprotected. This legislation is working, and it's working even when you control for things like species traits and the vulnerability to climate change. And this result was extremely important uh, in the uh, EU, uh, basically deciding not to open up these directives, but instead to call for them to be better implemented. So that's a sort of quick snapshot of four examples of the sorts of work we do that fall into these four categories. What I want to do in the, the last sort of 10 minutes or so of my talk uh, is to now show you how essentially one species or group of species has been taken right the way around this circle. It's a group that the story will be familiar to many of you, uh, certainly the beginning of it, but I hope less so towards the end, and it's that where I'll focus, uh, and relates uh, to these species, it's the gypsy vultures of India and Nepal. Three species of vultures uh, that were uh, one of the most abundant species uh, on the Indian subcontinent until catastrophic declines in the 1990s, over 90% in a handful of years, brought these species to the brink of extinction. The cause, which is again now uh, relatively well known, was the widespread use of a non steroidal anti inflammatory drug to treat sick cattle. Uh, what was the evidence that, that showed this was the cause? Well, several fold, um, but perhaps the first ones came from the autopsies of uh, birds found dead in the wild. So what these autopsies showed was that many of these birds were dying of kidney failure and that where that was the cause of death, it was always associated with the residues of diclofenac in the tissues. Another line of evidence was that the timing of the introduction of diclofenac onto the market was almost exactly coincident with the onset of these catastrophic declines. 
And the final line was that there was a clear pathway by which this drug could reach uh, into the food chain. And that perhaps requires a little bit more explanation. So um, in Hindu culture, uh, cattle are sacred. When they die, they're taken to, to carcass dumps where they're skinned and left to be scavenged. And some very elegant modeling by Rhys Green um, showed that when you take into account the toxicity of the drug and the foraging ecology of the vultures, it's very clear that the levels of drugs being found in the tissues of carcasses sampled from carcass dumps was at sufficiently high levels sufficiently often to completely account for that decline. So clear evidence about what the problem is. What are the solutions? Well, there are several strands to this and I've illustrated them on this slide here. And I'll start on the left-hand side and the top left, obviously the most obvious solution is to ban the drug for veterinary use. And the Indian and Nepalese governments moved very quickly to do this, and it was banned by 2005 and 2006 in both countries. But diclofenac is very cheap and very effective. And so if uh, putting that ban in place would be extremely difficult for the rural poor who depend heavily on cattle without a vulture safe alternative. And that led to a search working with zoos and bird collections across the world um, for a safe drug, which was then tested with scientists in South Africa. And this one, Meloxicam, is now marketed as a vulture safe alternative to diclofenac. The other two strands of the solutions are on the right hand side of this figure of this slide. Um, the first was the absolute need to safeguard the species uh, in terms of setting up captive breeding populations. There are now five breeding centres, three in India, one in Nepal and one in Bangladesh. Together they house over 400 individuals of all three species and science has been instrumental in understanding how to breed these for the first time uh, in captivity. And finally, a real need to protect the existing colonies. And this we've done by uh, establishing vulture safe zones around these existing colonies, uh, using education and awareness raising to clear the area of diclofenac and ensuring that the cattle uh, put out for them are safe and have not been treated with this drug uh, before death. So a lot of solutions in place for quite a long time. Are they working? So the two things you want to know, of course, is diclofenac going down and our vulture numbers going up. So let's look first at the drug. And the answer is things are going in the right direction. So this slide shows you the prevalence of the two drugs, the safe meloxicam and the unsafe diclofenac, um, from carcasses in carcass dumps throughout the India, Nepal and Bangladesh. Uh, the different colour lines are different regions and you can see diclofenac has gone down in prevalence by about 50% and meloxicam has gone up. So that's great, but you may ask, given it was banned in 2005-2006, why is it still present in the environment at all? And part of the reason is that although it was banned for veterinary use, it can still be used for human use. And you can go into a, a pharmacy and ask for a human, uh, human diclofenac to treat cattle. So to try and understand how much of a problem this is, the team has been carrying out covert pharmacy surveys. So a local surveyor is employed to go into a pharmacy uh, to ask for a drug to treat a sick animal and then to buy the first drug he or she is offered. And what are the results of that? They're shown here. So this is the frequency with which these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are offered in pharmacies, diclofenac and meloxicam. They're sort of mirror images, so let's just focus on diclofenac. And you can see that in both India and Nepal, the frequency is indeed going down. But if you look, the scales on the axes are rather different. And in India, they're still much more prevalent than in Nepal. Why is that? Almost certainly because in, in Nepal, there's been really fantastic awareness raising and education with strong government support. And there are no manufacturers of diclofenac in that country. And it's India, in fact, uh, that we're now focusing on in terms of trying to release uh, captive birds back into the wild. So what are the birds doing? Drugs heading in the right way, what are the birds doing? To some extent, the trends reflect the difference patterns in these drugs, uh, and I've shown that here. So these are the vulture trends in India and Nepal, taken from road transects over time. You can see in both countries, the declines are slowing. Only in Nepal do you see consistent recovery in these populations. As I've said, it's in the lowlands of Nepal that we're now looking to start to release some of these captive birds. This is a bird that's ring tagged and satellite tagged, uh, which has been released into a vulture safe zone in lowland Nepal. And of course, the ultimate aim of the project is to, to have all of these captive birds free flying in the wild 
a safe environment uh, for all these species. So I'm just going to end really there by saying I hope what I've done is shared with you the sort of breadth and depth of the work that we're doing at the RSPB around these four important questions in conservation science. Um, as I said, it's a snapshot of what we do. Um, but if you'd like to learn more, please do visit our website or, of course, ask me questions uh, now or later. Thank you very much. Um, thank you ever so much, uh, Juliet, uh, for your uh, fascinating talk. Um, so we've got lots of questions that have come in, um, so I'm going to uh, go and pick some of these questions that have, have been coming in and they're um, across the different components of your talk, so there's quite a variable uh, number of questions here. Um, so I'm going to start off with a talk from Krishna Girish, uh, who's asking about um, your studies of migration. And they are asking, for migrant species, what happens if on root sites, which the birds have a high degree of uh, fidelity towards, become unviable due to, say, climate change or habitat loss? Uh, what sort of effects might you see? And might there be more vagrants or perhaps a different or alternative migration route? Gosh, very good question. With, um, I think probably a whole range of answers, really, because it depends very much on the, the nature of the, of the migrant you're talking about. So some, of course, migrate on very broad fronts, use multiple staging and stopping areas, and may well be able to shift uh, and adapt to that loss. Others, particularly things like waders that concentrate in key areas, if they lose a key site, obviously a much more catastrophic impact uh, on that population. So I think it very much depends on the nature of the migration um, and, and of those staging areas. Um, and, and, you know, it will be very species specific. Um, but clearly, the more, the more bits we knock out in the chain of migration, you know, the bigger the problem is going to be for many of these species. Um, that's great. And um, moving on to questions about your GOLA um, Sierra Leone studies. There's a question here from uh, Sathya Chandra Saga who asks a very topical question, and with more zoonotic diseases predicted to threaten us in the future, how do you think we might use this as a way to leverage um, uh, extra protection and stop habitat loss in the wildlife trade, particularly in um, tropical regions? Yeah, again, very good question. Uh, and clearly that is something that I think many uh, conservation organisations have, uh, have been thinking about currently particularly. I mean, all I would say is that there are of course many reasons to protect tropical forests, not just zoonotic diseases. Um, their contribution to climate change, obviously to biodiversity per se. Um, but this is a, another factor that perhaps has made it more real to many, the bigger part of the population, uh, to understand that this constant pushing into pristine habitats, uh, exposing animals to each other that perhaps had never been exposed to each other is going to exacerbate this Im Im immersion of uh, immersion of exotic diseases. So um, absolutely, it's another, another one of the tools that we as conservation scientists can use to protect these absolutely crucial bits of habitat around the world. Um, that's great. Then we've got uh, um, staying in uh, Sierra Leone, um, thinking about uh, cocoa and chocolate bars, which sounds a good Hello. idea. Um, <laughs> question here from uh, Sophie Bennett. Um, where species uh, composition differs between abandoned and active cocoa sites. Do you have an understanding of whether the species that are lost uh, are all closely related species? So in other words, is a whole family of bird species edged out? And do you have an understanding about why that, uh, whether that results in loss of ecosystem services? Yes, thank you. Another, another fantastic question uh, with a kind of multiple answers, really. So, um, I mean, the species that, that go first, really, are the, are the highly forest dependent species. So they will, they will be ones that are lost uh, first. Uh, and that is true within, within the cocoa compared to the, the forest. Um, and um, the, the work that we're carrying on around the cocoa is looking quite particularly at how do we maintain the best uh, bird community composition. So is it about connecting these uh, cocoa plantations or smallholder farms to the forest? Is it about uh, the size of them? So the sort of way in which you might actually cultivate cocoa, how much shade, how connected to each other and to the forest you need to be to maintain the bird community closest to that uh, protected forest. Um, so um, not a very specific answer, but that's the sorts of species you'll lose first uh, and a lot more work to try and really maximize the value of that shade cocoa um, for the forest bird community, which is what we're doing now. 
Um, that's great, Juliet. We've got a lot more questions coming in, so I'm just going to take um, one more question and then I'll let you off the hook. <laughs> so there's a, I think a I'm question some more later, aren't I? So you know, I'll, be, I'll try and answer some more questions offline to all those that are asking. Absolutely. Uh, there's a question here, uh, anonymous question. Um, do you ever find that when protecting birds around the world that you end up indirectly protecting other species too? And um, do you happen to know of an example of that? So I think this is a question about flagship species, isn't it, that, that you know, um, will confer benefits on others. Um, I think the answer to that I would say is that in much of the work the RSPB do focuses on birds, but it always is about protecting the habitat as a whole. Uh, clearly all these species require places to nest and places to feed uh, and so it is about the whole habitat um, and often we use birds as flagships um, to secure protection um, you know, of, of other species and I mean in a way Gola is part of that. We started there around Picothartes and Gola malimbi which are the bird species that we're particularly interested in um, and it's very evident um, that actually there are many other mammal species that will benefit from protection of that forest. So I would say that most of the work that's about conserving a, an individual bird species is always about conserving the ecosystem uh, and all the other species and plant, you know, plants and animals that go in with it. Um, that's great. Um, thanks so, so much, um, Juliet. Uh, so that brings today's Ecology Live uh, to a close. And I'd like to thank Juliet and thank you to everyone for um, joining the talk um, online. Um, so next week at the same time, we'll have Florian Altamat from the University of Zurich introducing us to the biodiversity presence in river networks and the ecosystem services uh, they provide. And finally, I'll leave you with details of the offer from the sponsors of today's Ecology Live talk, NHBS. Uh, see you again next Thursday. Bye now.